Hello, and welcome to the Meet Your Species podcast. My name is Heath, and on today's episode, we're going to meet John Paul. Now, I met John Paul because I was an actor long ago, and uh, back in 2014, whenever I would have to go to auditions, I would often go to a taping service because they have the whole camera set up and everything ready to go. And you could go in, record your audition, get a little coaching if needed, and um, off you pop. And so John Paul was one of the people who was uh, recording, and um, he did a great job. He really helped me, and I got to know him a little bit over multiple auditions. And so he was kind enough to sit down and do this podcast with me. So we're actually doing this in his uh, company, which you'll hear him talk about later. But um, John Paul is a very calm voice, and uh, just his general presence is very nice. I, I really enjoyed uh, speaking with him. And also, I found it amusing going back now that it's 2020, and I'm looking back on this, how I was just... I don't know, I feel silly, <laughs> but I still want to share this with you because John Paul is amazing. So without further ado, I give you John Paul. Let's dive in. Cool, let's do it. So I like to start by getting to know who you are and how you think and that sort of thing. So I guess let's start with uh, your childhood. Like, What was that like? Wow, uh, my childhood. Well, I guess the thing that immediately pops into mind is that I moved around quite a bit. Yeah. So okay. I was born in England. Really? Yeah. And we moved to the States before I was even a year old. That's no accent. Hence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But your parents are English? Oh, my dad is. Um, he grew up in Manchester. My cool. mom grew up in the Midwest. Do you ever get to go back? Uh, I've lived well, there on and off a few times. Uh, I've not been back for a while, though. So, so what's, I guess, what, um, what are some interesting things that you noticed from that that maybe other people that never lived there at all? would not know about would not know about England or would not know about yeah or just like what the experience is like I'm sure it's a little different climate little different mentality of the people and that sort of thing yes it is um, I guess having an English father kind of made it all seem more normal for me so there wasn't much of a culture shock no, I don't mean culture shock. I just mean like things you encounter other people you're like oh I guess I didn't think about it because I was used to it but other people maybe aren't used to it and so it, is there anything like that maybe i'm just <laughs> none of that uh yeah they, they, um the english people tend to be enthralled with american tv for some reason really yeah at least they were when i lived there that's interesting more than they want to admit <laughs> That's funny. Sort of the same way I think that Americans are enthralled with some of the British programs. Exactly, yeah. because they're so different. Like, But the funny thing is we aren't ashamed to admit that we like the British TV. Or are they like ashamed to? Admit Not ashamed, but they, like, no, no. they're more into it than they'll let you know. So it's maybe like a guilty pleasure for them. I think maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. I didn't even think about that. Because I always felt like they have, in England, just more entertaining news and shows and things i mean yeah we have maybe a little higher production value maybe we've gotten prettier people on the tv shows but they always seem to value wit a lot more than we do well there's a different wit there's a different yeah there's different um, things they emphasize in their entertainment i don't know if it's any more or less entertaining on the whole but the, yeah there's there's differences that that they focus on that we notice because we don't focus on them <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Um, well, so going back, you said your mom's from the Midwest? Yeah, she grew up um, in Iowa and West Virginia. Okay. And they actually they met in um, Kenya, in Africa. Really? Yeah. Okay. That sounds like a story. It is a story. <laughs> they were both on different volunteer programs, and the two groups got together for a couple weeks in the middle of their. Uh, you know, trips over there, and they got to know each other over those two weeks and fell in love. Got married six months later. I like it. Kenyan love. Ken yeah. <laughs> so we got an American, meaning an Englishman in Kenya. I mean, you're, you're practically tri-continental at this point. It's a good mix. There's a good mix in my, uh, in my uh, family genetic background, yeah. I like that. <laughs> um, okay, so... So, I guess let's keep going. So... Started in England, came here. Yeah, we moved to the States when I was very young. Um, early years in New York, then moved to Chicago when I was five. 
grew up in uh, Wilmette, which is a suburb just north of the city. Of Chicago? Yeah, which has um, actually has a very famous landmark, the Baha'i Temple. Really? Is, in, is in Wilmette. Wilmette, um, really beautiful landmark, right on the um, on the the, the coast of um, Lake Michigan. What kind of temple is it? Um, it uh, I don't know. I don't know what to how to describe it. It's it's, um, it's very circular. It's got one big dome. Yeah. I don't know the details of the Baha'i faith much, but oh, that's the faith. The faith, yeah, Baha'i. Oh, I've never even heard of that. Yeah, Interesting. it's. Yeah. Is that an Eastern thing, likely? No. Um, I'm trying to recall. It's been so long since I've been there. It's um, now. I'm not even going to guess. I couldn't. I couldn't tell you what it's about. Something for me to Google later. Google Baha'i. <laughs> Baha'i Temple in Wilmette. Anyway, the architecture is amazing. It's a really beautiful place. Awesome. I really want to see that now. Yeah. I need. I need to travel everywhere. You've been to some interesting places. Around. Um, then we moved uh, after we met. We moved back to London when I was twelve. Spent a couple years there. Middle school was in England. Then moved back to New York and spent some years in high school there. Then moved back to London, <laughs> where I finished up high school, and then went to um, New York for college. And then moved back to London after college to work for a little while. Interesting. Yeah, a lot of bouncing around. Definitely. Yeah. So, along the way, were there any? Um, really impactful experiences or people that come to mind that help kind of shape the way you think about the world? Uh, my second grade teacher uh, really? was an amazing guy, Mr. Pritikin, who just was, to me, seemed to be interested in everything. And it was just fascinating. He always had something new to show us and teach us uh, or tell us a story, play a song, um, teach us how to play um, some game here or there. So. Second grade to me is, is I just have this memory of this wonderful adventure of learning all these cool things. Oh, and by the way, I learned some some math and writing as well, of course. Well, you know, those things. <laughs> so he was, he was a pretty big influence um, just to see the world as an exciting place. Maybe not teaching so much to the test, but... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> um, of course, moving around a lot um, helped me to be able to just very quickly become comfortable in new situations because okay. you kind of have to. Yeah. I've been getting that a lot. A couple of the people we've had on is they're um, just moved around a lot as a kid. And it's funny how that seems to leave you with a, a, a sense of, you know how to start over, you know, that it's going to be okay. Yeah. But then also you kind of have to find people that, understand it it's so. a bit of a double-edged sword it makes it very easy to start over and it makes it very easy to start over mm -hmm. it's almost like it so you have to if the, the balance is learning not to quit and say oh, i can start over too soon i can see that yeah i can see that for sure it's been the uh... Something I didn't realize until adulthood that I was like, oh, maybe I should just stick it out a little more. <laughs> um, okay, so went to England all around, learned from your second grade teacher. Then um, where we're moving forward. Were there any other things? Maybe something from England, maybe something from your parents. It's really stuck out or um I have um, I've never really seen my parents fight. They've, I mean, I've seen them get a little bit, you know, tense here and there, but they've never had a really big argument in front of me that I'm aware of. So um, I have a very calm perspective on the world, yeah. and I believe in... <laughs> that there's always a way to approach things from a calm perspective. I think that's what I've, one of the major things I got out of my parents. Definitely. Yeah. Maybe you pulled it a little bit out of that temple. <laughs> <laughs> so got something by osmosis, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Lived a mile away from it. Drive by calmness. <laughs> Drive by calmness. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> All right. Uh, anything else? Like to mention? Um, 
I think uh, I think it's a very healthy thing to live in different places. Yeah. Uh, to get uprooted once or twice. I didn't want to at the time. Uh, of course not. When we when my parents told me uh, when I was twelve that we were leaving and moving to England, I was very upset. Yeah. Uh, I was you know I was all excited to go into middle school. I was about to go into middle school the next year, and it's a whole big step, of course, mm-hmm. when you're when you're that age. And I was now being pulled away from this thing that I've been looking forward to for the past six years. Right. And of course, losing all my friends, or so I thought. That's what it felt like. Yeah. Do you, do you still keep up with many of your friends from different places? I don't keep up with anybody from elementary school. I keep up with a lot of people from high school and uh, a few people from college. Yeah. Hmm. It's good to know. Yeah. I, yeah. It's, Facebook is a wonderful reconnector. Yes. It's, I don't know how things worked before that. Like trying to send a letter and then maybe you wait a few months to get a response. I do. Yeah, I've connected with people I thought I would never see again in my life. And if if people say what they want to about Facebook, but for that one thing alone, I think it's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Is it, the, the more problems you notice is just because you're probably spending just too much time on it. <laughs> it doesn't make it bad I'm with you. Um, all right. So what are you doing now in your life? What I am doing now is pursuing acting. Um, I have an agent and I audition regularly in class. And to pay the bills, I tape auditions for other actors and coach them through their auditions if that's what they want. So I have somehow managed to find a way to make acting support me. You're, From you're one side or the other. A crafty actor. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how does that, I, I would assume taping a lot of people auditions helps you as an actor too, right? Absolutely. Um, I've, over the past couple of years of doing this, I've become much more sensitive to seeing what what people are giving or not giving in their audition. And and being able to form an opinion about it, and in my very very humble opinion, I think my opinion is decent. <laughs> so, <laughs> so and you know people come to me for coaching as well. So I, I I have to have an opinion about what they're doing and give them feedback and and direction that hopefully makes them from an objective point of view, if there is such a thing, give a better performance. But more importantly, feel that they're giving more of themselves and and feel happier with their own performance and what they're doing. Definitely. Yeah. Would you say, I think a lot of times actors get a bad rap in, in just in terms of people that are completely disconnected from it. Maybe they only see certain parts of Hollywood actors that say things that they disagree with or whatever. And like so many of us, we see something that's other, just like mm-hmm. maybe the worst of it yeah. and assume that's everything. I don't think that has anything to do with acting. I think that's... No, I'm not saying it's right. I'm just I'm saying... Just saying they see somebody who's famous, just happens to be famous for acting, saying something they disagree with. They would say the same thing of a politician. Absolutely. Or, or, or a businessman or a, a famous painter who decided she had an opinion about something other than painting. Exactly. Yeah. So would you say that acting... I guess give us, give us an actor's perspective on... Um, how that's helped change the way you look at just living life. Maybe you understand people better a little bit from learning different rules or something like that. Acting has um, taught me a lot about myself more more than anything else, really. Um, Because I think at Certainly somewhere at the foundation of acting is sharing yourself and and letting yourself be seen, letting your truth about the circumstance of the the script come out through you. Um, And you really got to know who you are to do that, honestly, I think. And you got to know where you hold back as well and what your what your own issues are to get past them and to be able to express with your full palette of emotion 
Um, so studying acting for the past 10 years has shown me a lot of that, where, where I've hidden things, held back, or where I just naturally express well. So it's shown both sides. And of course, there's always more to learn. I'm, I'm still in class. Definitely. It's, it's a never-ending process. There's never a, a there. I'm not a, there's never anywhere, any time when I'm done. Yeah, you, and you never want to have that mentality anyway. Yeah. Right? Like, no, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> uh. I tell myself I know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. Well, you got you still, <laughs> still got to convince people you know what you're doing. Um, <laughs> so, are there any? Like you're a you're a person that lives in Atlanta. What? Just like anyone else, so what what issues have been impacting you, if any? Like, what do you, what are you noticing that kind of bothers you, or that you wish we'd focus more on? Uh, well, honestly, I don't let very much bother me, because um, I being bothered by something. I, I guess it can be motivating and and helpful and stimulating something, but I think it's much more productive to be excited by something. Um, and to see something you want to create or move towards rather than something that you want to move away from. Now you may say, well, it's this two different sides of the same coin. That's fine. But I like it better when I focus on what I want to move towards. Um, so with that in mind, I love, absolutely love the fact that more and more production <laughs> is coming to Atlanta. <laughs> Yeah. That there's a lot of studios being built. Uh, I think that's absolutely fantastic. Um, it would be nice if um, Atlanta became more of a city that was less dependent on cars yeah. to get everywhere and anywhere. So like more public transit? Um, different, Yeah, different types of transit. Um, I think Atlanta is a great city for bicycling. If if there were, you know, safer biking, safer biking opportunities. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the weather's pretty good most of the year. This is true. Yeah. Um, and I think the influx of people from the West Coast have definitely added a lot more bikers on the road. Yeah. But even even like downtown or in the middle of Buckhead, you just can't do anything if you don't have a car. No, it's scary too. And that is not optimal, in my opinion. No. So I would like to see us move um, in the direction of relying less on automobiles for all or getting around to where we want to go. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. All right. Well, how about this then? Um, as someone who's in the uh, entertainment industry in Atlanta, what are you noticing that's maybe still bottlenecking the industry a little bit that we can continually work toward focusing on? Um, I think a lot of actors perhaps don't understand or haven't experienced what the competition is from LA and New York. Like their skill set level or? There's, well, maybe their skill set, but more their drive, that's not quite the right word, their, um, their focus, their effort, what they do to prepare, how many extra miles they're willing to go to get what they want to get. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that in general, actors in Atlanta have experienced that. I'd buy that. And so quite literally, I get a lot of people here that I tape that are doing this as a hobby, which is fine. Mm -hmm. It's great. It's a, it's a nice hobby. But I think that has to be a different mindset than from I'm doing this professionally to make a career out of it. If that's what they want, they, it's a very different mindset than from this is a hobby. And I just enjoy the odd audition here and there. Definitely. Yeah. So, hmm. okay, so um, is there anything 
maybe maybe yeah i don't know i don't know where to go with that but uh well let me let me put it this way um i occasionally get actors from la and new york who are here on a project and they have to do an audition so they come in and tape with me mm -hmm. they come in and their very first take they are solid they have something definitive to give they are they're owning it they're saying hey this is me this is this is how i see this role here's what i got mm -hmm. more often with atlanta actors they come in the first few takes is them settling down getting comfortable refamiliarizing themselves with the lines or even in the worst case scenario trying to memorize the lines as they go <laughs> just like right through yeah now that's that's not that's that's not the majority of people I tape but sure. but if we see the low if we see the um, if we see that end of the spectrum mm -hmm. uh, that we probably don't see that end of the spectrum from LA and New York people that come into tape do you think that's just because they're not even getting in the door if you have that level of focus and effort? I, I don't know because I've not been to LA and New York, so I don't have personal experience of trying to audition out there. But from people that have been there and that I've talked to, I think that might be the case. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. More people, more confined, less work as everything's coming here. Yeah. I can see it. <laughs> so let's... Uh, well, is there anything beyond acting that's maybe impacting you? Whether it's, I don't know, like in the news, there's like these <clears throat> issues with Ferguson and everything else that's cascading after that. Or is there anything like that? I was very, very, very excited to see in the news today uh, President Obama's decision to move towards normalizing relationships with Cuba. Really? I didn't even see that. I don't I don't care why he's doing it. I don't care if he's got what his motives are. I'm just glad that he's doing it. Cuz I think that interaction, conversation, trade with all other countries is the best way to increase prosperity and peace throughout the world. And so that's I, I don't care what his motives are. I think it's a step in the right direction. Plus, I want a vacation in Cuba. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I don't want to smoke those Cuban cigars, dang it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, well, that's cool. I'm going to have to look more into that. Because, I mean, I get kind of why we embargoed. Like, nuclear missiles, maybe not the thing you want to play around with. But it's been a long time, and all those people are suffering this whole time. But what's impressive, just from my uh, slight background in... Um, sustainable agriculture is that when they got cut off, Cuba actually became very sustainable after a brief turmoil period. Yeah. Um, but they really had to figure their stuff out. And sure. Here's how we grow food correctly and <laughs> survive. It's, uh, yeah. So that, that was, that was really good news when I saw that for me. Um, the other, uh, the other big thing that I think about these days is what's happening, um, with, um, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, virtual currencies, mm -hmm. digital currencies. Um, I think the invention of the distributed blockchain, the ledger, blockchain ledger, is probably going to be seen as one of the greatest inventions in the course of, well, everything. <laughs> you know, just to, to not be too hyperbolic. Um, so uh, just in case someone doesn't know what blockchain is, can you briefly explain that so um i can try i'm not sure how yeah. articulate i'll be about so, it uh, uh what's the forewarning this isn't you know the experts talking about it <laughs> but uh, continue so it's it's basically a distributed database that has no central control in which consensus determines what the truth is of the entries in the database and consensus is determined by work done on um, computers, which of course requires um, time and resources. This so, is the Bitcoin mining. Yeah, uh, well, any any uh, virtual cryptocurrency, but, but Bitcoin yeah. spe specifically, yes. So 
now we have a system where uh, a consensus is achieved by people who have a, um, a stake in maintaining that consensus. Right, because like, we have to keep this together because it's right, my money. Right, because my investment in this is substantial. And if people start faking entries and saying, I have money when they don't, then of course the existing money becomes worthless. Mm -hmm. um, but what it does is it takes, it, it, now the control of the money supply, you're talking about Bitcoin, the control of the Bitcoin money supply is determined algorithmically programmatically predetermined, uh, which means it can't be manipulated by specifically governments. Uh, so for example, like the Fed adjusting inflation rate or something like right. that. Right. Um, so no longer, so if any any system that then becomes, would, would be to become relying on um, money like Bitcoin, you can't artificially inflate the money supply. You can't right. have a situation like Zimbabwe, where the government, or you know, quite frankly, the United States, where the government just prints money as it needs it, and devalues the existing money supply. Yeah, I've never understood that. Like, I've had people try and explain to me why inflation or deflation is a good thing, and I'm like, it just sounds like a terrible idea. <laughs> well, deflation is bad in the sense. And that is, a, it's a tax on savings. It's a tax on the money that you own. And so if you have a dollar now and there's, you know, 5% deflation a year from now, you don't have a dollar. You have what, what, 95 less. cents approximately. Right. Which I don't, like I get, yeah, if you have inflation, but why do you have inflation in the first place? Why are we buying things on credit? Why? why? <clears throat> I don't understand. Uh, we have inflation so that the government, well, because the government inflates the money supply. Right. But to have more money, to buy things that it wants to buy without, without explicitly taxing the populace to get the money. So it's a, it's a very underhanded way of taxing people. I mean, I, that makes sense. I still think it's a dumb idea, though. <laughs> well, you can't pay for it. You can't pay for it. Like, aren't you just... It's a big collective child <laughs> you've given a credit card to. And now we have the giant... Some, some people would tell you, yes, that's exactly what government is. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. So, so you're looking forward to cryptocurrency in whatever form makes the most sense. I'm looking forward to the... Well, I, it, of course, who knows what's going to happen. But I can foresee good outcomes uh, where... If it's adopted widely so and, and starts to replace national currencies, for example, now we've got a now we've got a currency that cannot be corrupted by some politician's dream and desire of conquest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, huh. So I can't imagine that uh, if. If a government that's been used to having control of the money supply starts losing that, that that's going to go down easy. I don't think it'll go down easy either. <laughs> <laughs> that oof, that'll be interesting. Yeah, people people got in trouble when they started using printing presses. <laughs> Powers that be don't go down easy. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, I guess we'll just have to see how that plays out. But um, yeah, things change one way or another, nothing lasts forever. And my hope is that this helps things change in a good direction without too many tremors and earthquakes in the change process. Yeah. I, I do have a little hope because, you know, for the last hundred years, obviously we've, as the U.S. has kind of been on top in terms of having a fingers and everything globally. But as all these other economies are rising, I think China actually overtook us in economy recently. Um, so like, I'm sure by some measure they did. Yeah. Not like they're, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't been in China, yeah. but, uh, just the idea that if Brazil and, uh, different countries, like, I don't know, maybe various African countries are eventually get past us or equal, then we actually have competition on that national level that we haven't had in a while. So I think that'll make it easier. Don't you? Yeah. Um, I, I tend to think, I, I, well, I don't know, I tend to be hopeful that in the future, 
nationalism will dissipate. The, na the nation state, I can hope, has run its course and starts to be less and less of a, a factor yeah. in human events. Well, certainly if we all get talking about things on a, like, literally can talk together now because of the internet. Right. So I, I think it's certainly inevitable at some point, right? Because it's why do we need someone else talking for us when we can talk when we never could before? Exactly. Yeah, we don't. Opa! <laughs> 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 yeah, get rid of the middleman. I'm down. Uh, <laughs> all right. So, any other any other issues that uh, catching your eye? I like red. Red is my favorite color. It's kind of like an issue. <laughs> <laughs> we, we just had this big serious conversation. I had to throw some humor in there. Exactly. In it on red, <laughs> naturally. <laughs> Um, all right, so let's let's skip on to uh, future. This is future. my favorite part because we get to. I thought we were just talking about the future. Well, I, I meant for that to be present, but oh, okay. Here's a, I guess, a more focused thing for from your perspective. Lay out for us what you think the next five years might kind of look like. Oh gosh. Um. I got no fucking clue, man. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> I, I, um, one of my mantras for the past year or so has been to just not worry about the how of things. Get a general sense of where I want to go, how I want to feel, and let the universe show me how it's going to get done. I can dig it. So... I, I can tell you what I hope things start to look for, and I've, I've told you some of that. Um, well, that's the next one. Yeah. I, so hope, what do you I hope things, I hope the world becomes a generally freer place. I hope people in all countries start to live more inspired, healthy, engaging, fulfilling lives. I mean, I know these are all big, lofty generalizations. Pageanty. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it would but, be nice, though. I mean, that's the starting place. That's, you know, start from those generalizations. Um, yeah, I think, I, think as, as, I think as technology progresses and we see the impossibility of control, uh, as we see, as, as, as governments begin to realize that there are now systems that they cannot control, they cannot shut down. Mm -hmm. um, that will that will begin to see that they'll stop trying. That's what I hope for. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting to wonder how that's going to work, especially when you've got like, like so. There's these big facilities that the U.S. is storing all this metadata, right? Yeah. I mean, who knows how much they're really <laughs> capturing? But still, it's not like they can process it right now. They're just storing it so when they can, it's there. So how's that going to work? Because eventually there'll just be too much data. It won't be feasible to even house the servers to keep everything on like a oh, private I server. I don't know about that. I, I, you don't think at some point there'll just be too much data when everything's no. streaming? No. Retina? No. No? There's, there's always a way to store data. OK. I, mean, I don't know enough about it. I just, I, it just seems like at some point, there has to be a breaking point in what either where's the money going to come from as people get to cryptocurrencies and then good luck trying to track everything. Oh, sure. If there's, if, there's, if there's no economic rationale behind it, then no one will have any motive to do it. Yeah. So that may make it not happen. But I don't think there's a technical limitation. You don't think so? You don't think eventually we'll just from limited resources? Or like no, everything's a resource. There's no such thing as limited resources. Well, I mean... Yes, technically the whole Earth is made of I mean, atoms that we can use. But. Yeah, eventually they're going to figure out how to store a bit of data in the spin of an electron. So okay. now the information density is is really, really high, right? It's, yeah, if you can read it. Well, yeah. That's like the big, well, I mean, who knows? They're in their infancy. But I've been learning about the quantum computers and how they 
just like manipulate one little atom this way and that triggers this response or whatever. Yeah. But you can only do certain types of, I don't know, it's insane. It's, it's so cool. <laughs> I love that. Um, <laughs> all right. So anything else you'd like to see? Maybe, maybe just specifically with Atlanta, you'd like to see in the next five years? Ooh, um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't mind seeing Atlanta be more recognized as a center of the entertainment industry. I think that just from a personal just cause, like, place, selfishly, that would be, that'd be awesome. from a selfish point of view. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> I love Atlanta. I want to stay here. It would be great if Atlanta were the center of the universe for my personal interests. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> All right. Let's. Uh... Let's finish up. I like to end these lightly. Okay. Um, let's just do what you, John Paul, would like to do in the next five years. Just totally selfishly, like, what's what's your life going to be the next five years? Or at least what do you want it to be? One big magical adventure. Um, of course, I'd like to have wonderful, fantastic op acting opportunities. I'd like to continue to grow as an actor. Um, I'd really like to have fun making a fun movie with fun people. Yeah. And just having a good time, enjoying that whole process. And, and I mean that like in, on a major... Major production. Major production. I've, 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 I do, I've had plenty of fun on the films that I've been in, um, yeah. but never on a major film production. And so that's, that's one of my personal goals. It's to okay. be in that environment. Yeah. Every every time you watch one of those movies where you, you can you can just tell like you guys are just having fun. That's yeah. Like, it's just some of those movies and you're like, God, what it would have been to be on that set for those those couple of months or three months, whatever, how long they were filming. That must have been a joy. <laughs> yeah. I wanna I wanna I wanna experience that. Sounds like a good goal. Yeah. I want some of that too. Yeah. <laughs> Let me know when you start filming. <laughs> I also want to learn how to use a wingsuit. Oh, like the squirrel suits? Yes. 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 They're so awesome. <laughs> yes. I don't. I don't even know how to skydive, so I've got a long way to go. But yeah, I think there's a lot of training. But man, that just looks so worth it Doesn't in terms it? Yes. of like gratification from just skim the surface of the cliff at 200 miles an hour. Yeah, I'm not gonna make it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I I think a good intermediate that you could do sooner until you get all the training done is like hang gliding. I've done that. Have you? I actually got my level one hang gliders pilot's license. Really? Okay. So what's your, what's your, uh, what do you like about hang gliding? Or maybe what, what was, well, I'm assuming you like it since you got certified at some level. Level one's pretty basic. You basically yeah. need to demonstrate that you can have a controlled descent off a sand dune. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, and and there's some knowledge questions as well, um, but it's it's not like you have long half an hour flights here and there. It's basically running off a tall hill and just gent whoosh. controlled controlled glide down the hill. Whooshing. Yeah, <laughs> which is in and of itself exciting. It's, if you've never done it before, it's a cool thing. Um, well, flying is awesome. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I've got this dream of having a hang glider with like solar panels as the wings and then a little electric fan so I can just so go. Keep, keep going. <laughs> it's dark. I'm going to land. <laughs> Maybe a little iPad with GPS. That's how I get around. Nice. I could I, I could see that. Happening. Nice. <laughs> All right. Um, is there anything you'd like to plug to any listeners? Well, if there's any actors in the audience and they need an audition taped, or, and or coached, I uh, would be delighted to have them check out my website, actortapingservices.com. Dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-
Cool. All right. Well, thanks. You got it. Appreciate it. All right, everybody. Uh, all the info will be in the description. And go see John Paul if you have ta uh, taping needs. It'll be there for you. All right. See you next time.